Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, I, I'm particularly excited about this Shabbat. Uh, probably one of the most, the most excitement I felt in the last uh, eight years here. And before I start, you know, before Jamie told me I was going to be speaking today, uh, I shared some of this um, new insights, new wisdom, old wisdom, but a new way of looking at it, uh, with a lot of the Chavrit student support. And it was really exciting for me because I'm understanding it more and more each time. And Jamie told me when I'm going to be speaking today, he said, you know, shake everybody up, get them excited. There's a lack of energy here in Los Angeles. And we got to, you know, get back to the seed level and get really juiced and get some excitement. And I realized, I know it's funny, and I saw something in the newspaper this morning that said, uh, when talking, there was an article about how to really communicate. And it said, show, but don't tell. In other words, I'm not going to tell you to be excited. I'm not going to preach to you to be excited, because if I'm going to do that, you're just going to be reacting to it, and it's not going to lead anywhere. And if the wisdom itself and the information I'm going to share with you tonight doesn't excite you, you don't get it. And if you don't get it, that's okay. Admit you don't get it. Study harder. Try harder. Because when you do get it, you're going to be excited beyond measure. We just don't get excited because we don't understand it. And don't feel bad about not understanding it because there's a reason why we don't get it easily. There's a reason why it's difficult to get it. And that reason ties in directly to this particular portion of the week. And I want to begin, if I may, by just sharing with you a really funky insight about the purpose of this place and our understanding about the nature of reality. You know, you have to logically believe in the concept of God in order to serve God. If you don't believe in God, are you going to serve God? Never. So you can't touch God, you don't see Him, you don't have a two-way conversation with God, but based on just faith and belief, we dedicate our lives, many of us in this world, a portion of our lives, our entire lives, in serving God. Do you know what's really amazing? You don't have to believe in the opponent, you don't have to believe in the Satan, our adversary, in order to serve him. Not only that, and think about this, because it's not just a you know, cute insight. If you did believe in him 100%, you would never serve him. Never. If you knew what his game was about, if you really, truly understood, recognized him, acknowledged him, got him, you'd never serve him. So the whole idea of skepticism and doubt is the very lifeblood of Satan. It's how he exists. Our doubt, our skepticism, is the very marrow of his being. He can't exist without our doubt. And that's why this particular portion, the Haftorah reading, is all about the war against Amalek, which as we know, if we've been studying Kabbalah, really means, who cares about Amalek? What's Amalek? Some nation Three, three, two, three thousand years ago. The war against Amalek is the war against doubt. Now, we've heard this, if you've been studying Kabbalah, at least as far as I've been studying for the last 19, 20 years, I've heard this concept over and over again. But now we're able to reduce it down to one simple premise. The war on doubt is one war. The doubt in the believability and the existence in the Satan that exists within us. There is no other doubt. There is absolutely no other doubt. Now, how does that rate to relate to our lives? Has anybody here ever experienced a really nagging, excruciating toothache? Raise your hand. Like the worst kind and you're shivering and you're full of anxiety because you got the toothache but you also don't want to go to the dentist. To, 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 you know, to treat the toothache, it's terrible, right? So would it be safe to assume that everybody here possesses right now a desire not to want to have a toothache? If you don't want to have a toothache, if you have that desire, raise your hand. I mean, you want to have a toothache? <laughs> Can I ask you a question? 30 seconds ago, before I brought this subject up, were you aware 
that you had a desire not to want to have a toothache? No. You know why? Because that, de- listen carefully, that desire was already fulfilled. You didn't have a toothache, thus you were completely unaware, you were unconscious to the fact that you have a desire not to want to have a toothache. But if suddenly, God forbid, your tooth started aching right now, boom, your desire would awaken, you'd say, I don't want to have a toothache. And then when that toothache pain dissipated, when it vanished, you'd feel great fulfillment, correct? Okay, this is the problem. When we, the souls of humanity, were originally created, every possible desire was already fulfilled. We were born into reality a completely fulfilled soul. But just like you were unconscious of your desire to have a toothache because that desire was completely fulfilled, we were literally born unconscious, unaware. Here's the key word now unappreciative of what the Creator was instilling within us. All the fulfillment, joy, and believe me, it's beyond whatever you could imagine, from sex and chocolate to pizza to whatever, children, soulmate, every conceivable pleasure we had a desire for it, but we were born with that desire already fulfilled. We were unconscious. So we said to the Creator, hey, we want to wake up. We want to truly appreciate We need to experience a reality, a world, that would ignite our desire. So if you have a toothache, that pain awakens the desire. Now what I'm going to say, I I believe truthfully, is sickeningly frightening. And if you don't get frightened by what I'm going to say, and you don't really consider the implications of it, you're not getting it. If God, if the light that we were born into consisted and included immortality, we had to experience a world of death in order to thirst for immortality, in order to have a desire not to experience death. You know, if you're all filled up right now, you just drank two bottles of Kabbalah water and I brought you a cold glass of lemonade, you don't want the lemonade right now. But if you walked in a bone dry desert for three days and I gave you a glass of lemonade, you're going to thirst for it, you're going to enjoy it. If the light that we were born into included infinite happiness, we needed to experience infinite profound sadness in order to awaken a thirst and a hunger for that happiness. If infinite serenity and contentment and peace of mind was included in everything that was fulfilling us, we said we need to experience extreme mega depression fear, anxiety, in order to awaken a desire and a thirst for that healing and that fulfillment. If the light was infinite good, we said, drop us into a world of infinite evil. Are you scared? Look around. This is what we asked for? Look around. You see infinite evil. You see endless depression. You see terrible, bad, suffering, pain. We see it in small scales, medium scales. We see it on a global scale. You feel it in your lives, in certain areas of your life, if you're waking up to what real pain is. And this is what we ask for. Which means what hope is there? We're going to have to go through pain. That's why we came here, to go through pain. Infinite pain. In order to awaken that desire, yeah, the reward is going to be great and we'll have it for eternity. And we're only going to experience infinite evil for maybe, you know, five, six thousand years. But you really want to go through it? And here comes the question of the day. If God is infinite and he includes infinite solutions to our problems, couldn't God also come up with a solution to the ultimate paradox of existence? Which is, how do we experience infinite pain without having to experience infinite pain. How can we awaken that desire? God, can't you figure that one out? I mean, because logically, you know, all the capitalists of history, if you read their books, it's mentioned practically in every one. You only know something by its opposite. 
You only know white when you see black. You only know light when you see darkness, right? Philosophy talks about that all the time. You know something by its opposite. So logically, we cannot, we cannot experience the fulfillment and the, the desire for immortality, infinite joy, happiness, great sex, whatever you want, you know, whatever you want to call it, what it means in your life, that kind of happiness. You had to experience the opposite. Pretty freaking depressing, I think. So, if God is infinite mercy, can he not solve the paradox? And the good news is, God solved the paradox. You ever watch a Hollywood movie? And you see Harrison Ford or some actor, he's jumping off a train or running through a fire. Does the actor, in most cases, does he usually do it? Who does it? Stun double. He absorbs the pain. God, in his infinite wisdom, put us into a world of infinite evil, death, and suffering. But he also created, not many people, nobody knows this, he created a stunt double. Someone to take the pain for us. But stupid us, we don't let the stunt double take the pain. Why? We don't know he exists. We doubt his existence. The stunt double, you may have heard of him. He goes by the name of Satan. He's not the evil, negative, dark being who came to destroy us. He came to take our pain. He is our ego. And either the body will experience death or the ego can experience death. Either the body and soul can experience profound sadness or we can let the ego do its job and experience the profound sadness of getting your ego hurt and insulted. The ego came here to take our pain. And every time we recognize the ego, that is when we appreciate and earn the fulfillment. All we got to do is take the momentary pain of saying, wait, it's not me, it's the ego. Now, there's a very famous story in the Zohar, we all heard it, but I think you can repeat it a thousand times to really understand the profundity of it. The Zohar is explaining why there is a force called Satan. And there's a story about a king who was a true king in the true definition of the word, a compassionate, loving king who loved the subjects of his kingdom, loved them like his own children. And he wanted to abdicate the throne, retire, had enough, but he wanted to make sure that his son, the prince, would be the same kind of compassionate, loving king and really serve the kingdom and the subjects well. So he knew he had to test his son. So he asked his son for a favor. He said, look, I want you to demonstrate your great love for me. Because if you can show loyalty and love to me, I know you can give loyalty and love to all the subjects of this kingdom. The so prince said, sure, what do, you, what do you want? He said, do me a favor. Right or wrong, leave morals out of it, do me a favor. Do not ever engage in a sexual relationship with a hooker. Stay away from the harlots. Do me that one favor to demonstrate your love. Prince, you know, he was a man of big sexual appetite, but he said, no problem, okay. The king sent him away to another village, and then he summoned the most beautiful, seductive, charming hooker you ever laid your eyes on. He said to her, for the benefit of the kingdom, I want you to do me a favor. I want to make sure you are all ruled. You and all your fellow subjects of this kingdom are ruled by a, a loving, compassionate king. I want you to go test my son. Seduce the pants off him. Get him into bed. She says, okay. So she goes to the village where the prince is you know, conducting business on affairs on behalf of, of his father. And she tries everything. And she's gorgeous. She's stunning. And he's ready to take her. And then he realizes, I made a promise to my father. So, mustering all his willpower, he resists. He returns back to his father. And the Zohar tells us there's now even a greater love, a greater bond between the father and the son. And the king gives the son the crown, the throne, the treasures of the kingdom, and the story ends. And the Zohar asks the great question, who is responsible for the son inheriting the crown, the kingdom, and having a greater love with his father? Who's ultimately responsible? The hooker. Exactly. That is the role of Satan. 
In other words, he came here to take our pain. But he's going to make it very darn difficult. Because if he just takes it, we don't earn it. It's, it's not like we're going to awaken a desire. And that is why, from the beginning when I started out you know, sharing with you today, this is why his only weapon is our doubt. We cannot, do not believe in his existence. Oh, we might get it intellectually. Yeah, the Satan, the opponent, cute, funky concept. But how many of us are prepared to confront that opponent and let our egos die? We would rather bleed to death physically over a long period of time than endure a quick death of the ego. And guys, it's okay. It's supposed to be difficult. You know, it's so easy to serve God, we see the light. So, what's the big trick? We come into this place and we call it a synagogue. And we go after the light. And we pray to the light. And we want, to, and that's the wrong approach. This is why the Rav says this is a war room. We came to wage war on the ego. One path leads to religiosity. The other path is a bloody war against the ego. Letting it take our pain and suffering because we don't recognize it. The war is learning how to recognize the ego. Rabbi Ashlag, the founder of our center, says there's only one thing we can do. He says, folks, you're not going to beat Satan. You'll never beat him. What you can do and all you have to do, recognize him. The moment you recognize them, then the light comes in, the power of this portion comes in and sucks them out of you. That's why doubt is the only weapon he has. We don't really believe it. We think if we surrender our ego, we're going to be less, we're going to have less, we're not going to have true fulfillment. We don't really believe it. We say we do, we don't. If you admit you don't believe it, if you admit your weakness, you just expose the Satan, and now the power of this portion will eliminate it. That's what the whole parting of the Red Sea was about. What was being parted? We were separating the ego from the self. There was one man who walked into the Red Sea when the Egyptians were behind them, and the Red Sea was in front of them, and death was before them. You turn around, you're going to die. You go forward, you're going to die. But one man understood one man understood the ego was there to take the pain. I'll walk in. What's the pain in this case? Fear of death. Oh, the ego is afraid. I'll let my ego experience a fear of death, fear that there's no God, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to walk into the Red Sea. He completely surrendered. The ego took all the pain. And that's why you get an equal miracle in return. The Egyptians chasing the Israelites that you're going to read about is your ego. Your ego chases you and corners you at the Red Sea every day of your life, and you have no alternative. So what happens? Instead of jumping into the Red Sea and acknowledging our ego, we fight, and we experience a little bit of death. What does that mean? This is my favorite part, why I'm most excited, because this whole portion, but the Red Sea and the 72 names, it's not about getting miracles. It's about the... I mean, it's about getting miracles, but what miracles? I want to solve a problem. It's about immortality. And here's how it works. And you've, you've probably heard this a dozen times. If you don't get excited now, those dozen times you never really got it, you're not getting it now. Listen carefully. And I tell you that because I heard a hundred times, and maybe I'm a hundred the first time, I'm finally starting to get it. If the room is pitch black and I got a lamp sitting right here, the light is shining. If I take a curtain and I place it over the lamp, the room dims. But the lamp is still shining as brightly as before. I put a second sheet over it. The lamp is still shining as bright as before. I put a third sheet. Finally, I reach a certain threshold. The room is pitch black. That is death. Here's why death happens. Every time you react, Every time, whether you give the finger to somebody who cuts you off on the highway, you react to something terrible, you react to something good, any reaction that you don't know it's your ego, bam, you place a curtain over the light of your soul. Globally, you place a curtain over the light of the 99% reality. Death only happens when we reach a certain threshold of reactive behavior moments. 
reactive behavioral moments. That's it. If that's not motivation for not reacting, we're doomed. Now, my wife said to me this morning, what are you going to talk about? I said, immortality. She goes, what the hell? It means nothing to me. I'm talking to a friend of mine, she said, who's in deep, deep pain. She doesn't want immortality. She doesn't want to keep the pain going forever. What does immortality mean? And the rub has been saying this for the last, I don't know, 10, 12 years. And I don't think we got it because it's difficult. There's only one angel of death. If you're in a relationship and it dies, it's because of the angel of death. If you have a business and it goes sour, it's the angel of death. If your profits just drop a minuscule 3%, it's the angel of death who got in there 3%. If your clothes wear out, the angel of death got in there and that's why your clothes wore out. Everything that comes to an end that is the opposite of happiness and joy is the angel of death. So immortality means constant joy, constant orgasm, constant children, constant love, constant joy from food, continued rise profits, fulfillment, prestige, loved by my friends, giving love. It means endless happiness. That's what immortality means because death is everything that goes bad in our life, one source, angel of death. Who's the angel of death? The ego. Every reactive moment, every time you listen to your ego, you introduce a little portion of death into your life. So today is Tu Bishvat. What does that mean? The new year of the trees. Trees, isn't it funny? Trees live two, three hundred years long. Man lives what's an average lifespan of 72. You know why trees live so long? Because their whole existence is about restriction. They go against gravity. The tree would live forever, but the consciousness of man has an influence over the trees. So our consciousness gets in the way and helps kill them off. But because they exhibit constant restriction against gravity, gravity being the ego, they live 300 years. When we give up our ego completely, when we achieve the level where we can do restriction, true restriction, true resistance, true letting go of the ego, 100%, that's immortality in all parts of our life. So you ever try, I mean, when you study Kabbalah, uh, uh, you know, you know don't, be, don't, re, don't react to the physical world. So you see a new car, you want to buy it. No, I'm going to resist, I'm going to give it up. And you give it up and some miracle happens and somehow you end up getting it. Same thing with a new shirt, a new pair of shoes, a new relationship. And if you really examine your life, you will find that the more you gave it up, the longer the joy lasted from that particular item. You ever have a shirt lasted like 20 years, just never wore out? And now they're close to disintegrate in two weeks. What happened? Odds are the shirt that was destroyed in a week you bought it with such ugly stinking ego. And you put all that ego energy into it, and that's why it disintegrates. And when you buy something, you say, no, I'm going to give it up, I'm giving it, and you really give it up, it lasts longer. So relative, relative to the degree that we give up, that's so much immortality, en immortality energy we put into everything in our lives. If we're in a relationship with somebody, how relative that we give up our opinions, our selfishness, our own desires, and we consider the needs, the desires, the happiness of our partner, that's how long the relationship will last. Even if it's your soulmate, you can blow it. So, so that's the formula, and that's what today is about. We come into this room today not to chase the light, not to look for the light, because the lamp is right there, right there. We came to remove the curtains that are blocking the light. 99% of the house of worships in this world, they come in chasing God, not the Kabbalah center. We come here chasing the curtains. We came here to find those curtains that are blocking out the light that's already there. To lose the doubt, to recognize the time, to let him take our pain. We're so stupid. You know, if you're wearing a costume, and the costume is on fire. Are you going to leave it on? You're going to shed it, right? Take it off. When Satan is causing us pain, we keep wearing the costume. 
We don't let go and say, no, it's him. He's taking the pain for us. This, by the way, <clears throat> it's amazing. It's the whole secret of Purim. Why do you wear costumes on Purim? What does that mean? We get drunk out of our heads. We're full of joy if we're not throwing up. We're walking around loving everybody, yet I see his costume and I see her costume. Meaning I see their ego and I know it's not who they are. And they see my costume and the whole ego, the whole costume that we wear is exposed. Everybody sees it. And at the same time we're drunk, meaning it's our true soul, the happiness, the joy, the love and sharing. Both are existing simultaneously. It's about recognizing the ego. When you recognize it, that is immortality. You will no longer serve it. So before the reading, recognize your ego, get in touch with your mask, all the pain you had this week, whatever pissed you off, whatever saddened you, genuinely saddened you, Think about it. What really aggravated you? What pissed you off? What saddened you? What hurt you? What insulted you? What worried you? What fears did you have? What aggravation? Everything that's the opposite of the light, connect it to your own stupid ego. And then when we read the 72 names, the light comes in. And relative to how much ego you identified and said, yeah, that's will take the pain, the light will suck it out. And the goal is nothing less than immortality. Shabbat Shalom.